Good day and welcome to worship today. We are mindful of all that's been going on in the Olympics. It's been a strange one, but what a great one so far for the Australians. It puts me in mind of that scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And today I'm reading it from the message version. You've all been to the stadium and seen the athletes run. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that will tarnish and fade. You're after one that's gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm mindful that we've been reflecting on Ecclesiastes over these last weeks, where it speaks a lot about death, that as Christians we have a sure and certain hope that is an eternal hope when we get, die that we go to be with Christ. Therefore we should live our lives as though we're in that race, living for Christ every single day. Sure we all fail, but actually we're living for Christ every single day. Can I encourage you to live for Christ today? Let's come to God in prayer. Father, as we gather for worship in different places, we come as part of your church. We're conscious of our own failings, our own sin, and yet we want to train hard for you. We want to live for you. So help us, Father, live for you this week so that we may gain that gold medal that won't tarnish or fade. Help us to live eternally with you as our Lord and Master, Saviour and Friend. God bless us now as we worship together. Amen. Let's continue in worship as we sing together.
like you, I'm at home as we continue this period of lockdown, however long it might go for. I'm so thankful each week that we are able to meet together through an online service, and it's such a privilege as well to share in communion together. One body, committed to Jesus wherever we are, reminded afresh of the sacrifice of Jesus on each of our behalf. God, out of sheer generosity, put us in right standing with himself. A pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God set things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his rightness. What a great affirmation as we share in this time of celebrating communion together. I mean, the elements we've used over many lockdowns and many times in which we couldn't meet face to face, and as Jess reminded us last month of those individual servings of communion we use in services. No matter what you use, they're all symbols of the broken body of Jesus and his shed blood poured out to take the consequences of our sin on himself. The gift of love through Jesus. As you look at your elements now, reflect on this sacrifice and what this means to you personally as a follower of Jesus. Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Loving God, no words can express our thanks to you, that each of our lives is so valuable, you gave your only son to die in our place. We offer ourselves afresh to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Equip us in the power of your Holy Spirit, to live and work for your praise and glory. Amen. We now come to a time of offering. And this is where we give our money to the things that God is doing, both in our church and in our community. And it enables us to be a light to the community around us. Why don't you join with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given to us so that we might be able to give back to you. God, we acknowledge that the things that we have, uh, we wouldn't have apart from you, uh, and so we thank you for that. Help us to use our money and our time and all the things that we have 
wisely as we seek to be your light to our community and the people around us. We pray this in your son's almighty name. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for being a good and gracious God. Thank you for your unconditional love, your kindness, patience and forgiving heart. Lord, I thank you that despite the circumstances of this world right now, that we can continue to meet with you in prayer. There are so many events which are constantly changing around us, but Lord, how comforting it is to know that we believe in a God who never changes and walks through every season of life with us. Lord, in these days of lockdown, may we continue to find joy in each new day you bless us with. May we continue to make the most of our days and glorify you in all we do. Please help us to remain committed in seeking you each day and to trust you in the good and bad times. Even through this challenging time, may you continue to help us grow in our faith each day and mature spiritually. May we continue to serve you faithfully during this time, and although we can't meet together for the various ministries this church holds, we pray that we will remain faithful and dwell in your presence as a body of Christ. Lord, I lift up those within our church community who have recently lost loved ones. May your presence comfort them during this time of grief. We pray for those who have loved ones who are currently suffering from the virus. May you bring healing and restoration to their bodies. We acknowledge your sovereignty and trust that you will bring an end to this virus and the spread of infection. We also continue to pray for those who have ongoing health issues or living in residential care. Please be with them, especially during this time of isolation, when loneliness may be experienced, especially when the with the visiting restrictions in place. Father, we all have our own battles which we face, but God, I pray that you would remind us each day that these battles aren't for us to face alone. May we remember that you go before us and that you equip us with the strength to defeat and overcome our battles. God, we continue to pray for the Year 12 students within our church community. Be with them during this time of transitioning to online school and studying in isolation from peers. We also understand how hard and exhausting it is for the Year 12 students as their trial exams are constantly being postponed. I pray that your spirit of strength and peace will be with them all, and I pray that they will be able to find moments to rest during their busy weeks. Lord, I thank you for hearing our prayers and walking through each day with us. I pray this in your precious and mighty name. Amen. And so we come to our reading today, which is is from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. It's a selection of verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning to read at verse 1. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the songs of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Moving on to verse 11. Wisdom is like an inheritance. It is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Moving on to verse 16. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Wisdom makes one person more powerful than ten rulers in the city. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Verse 23. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Verse 29. This only have I found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. 
I had a laugh last week when Andrew sent me his draft for his chapter six sermon. His initial reaction to his chapter, oh no, more death, oppression, the relentless pursuit of wealth. My reaction to chapter seven, at first, oh no, more proverbs and unlinked words of wisdom. Clearly, the teacher doesn't make a good first impression, but the treasure is there to be found. So let's pray. Father God, we come again to this ancient book, yet it's one so relevant to our modern world, a world that so often leaves you out of the picture. Guide us by your spirit to what you would have us learn. Help us to consider you our God as we spend this time together. For the sake of your kingdom. Amen. I'm one of those personality types who love structure. As an English teacher, I loved, and still love, the tightly woven structure of a holy sonnet by John Donne, for example, written 500 years ago. Yep, I'm a nerd and proud of it. But sharing that love to a senior high school student was another matter. Some would get it. Others would wearily cry out, just tell us what to write, miss. Maybe it's the same for maths and science teachers. Those my age may remember Professor Julius Sumner Miller's call, Why is it so? And younger people may remember this scene from A Beautiful Mind. There's that search for meaning inside of us, for a pattern that makes sense of life. The teacher in Ecclesiastes is leading his students on a rather winding path towards considering God. Every now and again, I come across an article that gives some insight into the, how differently Hebrew literature works. In recent decades, some scholars analyze books of, of the Bible mathematically. Now, they don't always agree with one another, and the method has its skeptics. But I find it fascinating that a mathematical analysis of Ecclesiastes set the final verse of chapter 6 as the exact centre of the book. And what a wonderful summary of its central question that verse is. For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone? Over the past six weeks, we've read and listened as the teacher has demolished the ways in which humanity tries to find an answer to this question, when our worldview discounts the presence of God. And at the end of six chapters, the question still remains. So maybe in this second half of the book, the teacher may begin to answer it in chapter seven. Maybe. It would be good to have your Bibles open as we read, we read only selected verses from chapter seven. We shouldn't be surprised if some of the advice touches us as real and common sense. The opening verses, for example, remind us that we don't do a lot of deep thinking and or reflection when we're celebrating. Our emotions are high and light and excited. We're simply enjoying ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. Remember those times when we could actually go out and have dinner with a friend? I managed to sneak in a trip to Broken Hill just before this latest wave of COVID. I was so glad to have enjoyed and learned from the many different experiences in that area. But I suspect the teacher would ask me, how long will your memories remain? Or will they end up just as more photos in a file on the computer? But the contrasting statements of the teacher in these opening verses are very different to the way we want to see our world. And they're hard to hear, and particularly difficult at a time when in the life of our church, individual families and our church family are mourning the loss of loved ones. 
It is hard to read. It's better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting. Whether we want it or not, the death of a loved one or a friend reminds us of our own mortality, sometimes with a dreadful shock, sometimes with the slow and increased frailty of illness or aging. The message version of verse 2 is a bit confronting. You learn more at a funeral than at a feast. Yet those of us with a few years under our belts would agree. We reflect upon the legacy of the one who has died, the values that they held dear. What have we learned from them about living our life under the sun? The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But mourning is not just about death. In a recent edition of the Hope 103 online magazine, Ellie Holcomb says this about going to the house of mourning. It's not my normal. I generally try to avoid pain. And I realised, although I had addressed some of these wounds in counselling before, I'd never let myself grieve. I'd never let myself lament. There was a part of me that was scared that if I just let myself be sad about some of the wounds that I carry in my own story, some of the mistakes that I made and some of the prayers that didn't get answered in the ways that I wanted them to, I thought it might kill me. But as I went there and let myself simply breathe in some of those broken places, I encountered the nearness and the tenderness and the kindness and the empathy of God. Those of you who know me well will know that Ellie's experience resonated strongly with me. And the teacher's words also resonated. A sad face is good for the heart. We face our guilt, our fear, our loneliness, our brokenness, and encounter the tenderness and empathy of God. Of Jesus, who shared our pain and humanity. Jesus, who understands, forgives and heals. In those short verses of advice from the teacher, Jesus is a world of truth. If you truly consider God as central to your under-the-sun world, What's the opposite to this ability and willingness to reflect on life, on sadness and mortality? The teacher uses an image to describe the song and laughter of fools. The laughter of fools is like the sound of crackling thorns under the cookpot. Just a brief bit of context about thorn bushes in the ancient Middle East. Have you ever wondered in Jesus' parable about the sower, why farmers didn't simply just pull out the thorn bushes before planting the seed? Well, they did, mostly. But some were deliberately left on the edges of the field to provide quick firewood to cook lunch out in the fields rather than trudge maybe a kilometre or so back to the village for lunch and then back again. The ancient Israelites would have been much more aware than we are that the wood of thorn bushes creates a quick and noisy fire, which doesn't last long, just sufficient to heat the cookpot. The empty laughter of fools was present as the crown of thorns was placed on the head of Jesus just before the crucifixion. Consider God. The teacher would have been unaware of the power of that link between thorns and fools. But the link is there for us. How often have we heard preachers speak about the seeming foolishness of the cross? And how accurate and profoundly compassionate was Jesus' prayer for those fools then and for all of foolish humanity. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. 
Many years ago, I led a study on Ecclesiastes using this book by Derek Kidner, A Time to Mourn and A Time to Dance. The teacher explores a new line of argument in verses 17 to 21, which I want to explore just briefly. We didn't read these verses, so again, it would be good for you to have the chapter open. Kidner's overall heading for this section is, you might as well be rational. In a worldview that does not contain a faith in God, the best you can say is that some things are simply better because they make common sense. So, it makes sense not to abuse power or money. Both risk corrupting your own heart. It makes sense to exercise self-control, to finish projects and persevere rather than spit the dummy. It makes sense to live in the present rather than in nostalgia for the past. These ideas do make sense. But sitting in the back of his listeners' heads and ours is the teaching about the value placed upon wisdom elsewhere in Scripture. Proverbs 8, for example, creates a picture of Lady Wisdom who says, For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Lady Wisdom bases her advice about that on the fear of the Lord. Wisdom is the creation and gift of a holy God. Wisdom is the source of life and blessing to those who find her. The teacher hammers home what wisdom is like without God. Wisdom and wealth are useful. The message version captures it this way. Wisdom is better when it's paired with money especially if you get both while you're still living. Double protection, wisdom and wealth. Notice the tone. Wisdom and wealth are useful while you're still living. Wealth never satisfies. It just leads to a hunger for more. It was a theme of both chapters 5 and 6 that Andrew and Jess looked at. Now the teacher extends that idea. Well, maybe wealth combined with wisdom would work better. That sounds rational, doesn't it? Double protection. But not beyond the grave. Sorry. The teacher pushes the rational approach just one step further. And the argument is both ancient and modern. If God is in the picture, which he argued for strongly in the last chapter, and if God is in total control, what about that age-old conundrum of injustice? In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. The teacher's rational answer is at one level seemingly outrageous and yet disturbingly true if you're only giving grudging assent that God is part of the picture. So if you're being rational, you'll walk the fence. Not too much righteousness, not too much wickedness, just keep a nice balance. It's good to grasp the one and not let go of the other, Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. So says modern humanity. Don't push your luck if God is in the picture. That's rationality for you. After all, as the teacher concludes in verse 20, there's no one who does what is right and never sinned. No one's perfect. And the teacher reinforces this by something we all learn about ourselves in time the very thing, sins we are so quick to spot in others are probably the ones we are most guilty of hiding from ourselves. It all sounds uncomfortably familiar, doesn't it? You're only human. Don't beat yourself up about it. Be rational. So where does this leave the teacher 
and that central question. Well, who knows what is good for a person in life? Those of us who've tried to explain deeper issues will almost certainly have had the question, so what do you think? Where do you stand on this issue? Often the best answer is an honest, I don't know. Sometimes it's appropriate to share a little of our own experience as we've journeyed to try and find this. The teacher does a little of both. So there's the honest confession, all this I tested by wisdom and I said, I'm determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Then comes the self-revelation of his own experience the elephant in the room for a female preacher. I found more bitter than death the woman whose heart is a trap. She will ensnare you. I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. Self-revelation can be a bit awkward at times, can't it? And you may be thinking, what's she going to do about all of that? Well, Maybe the message version captures his disillusionment a little bit better. I didn't find one man or woman in a thousand worth my while. And I'm happy for you to address any other questions to either Andrew or Howard about that particular point. So is chapter 7 like all the others after all? Two more areas explored without answering that fundamental question. The teacher has one final comment to make about the only thing he can be sure of at this point. And I use the rather graphic expression of the message. Yet I did spot one ray of light in this murk. God made men and women true and upright. We're the ones who've made a mess of things. But I want and I must link this verse back to verse 20. From the pen of the teacher, writing centuries before the time of Jesus, comes echoes of the gospel. Humanity, God's final and beautiful creation, made a mess of things and could not do what is right. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who do, does what is right and never sins. But then Jesus, the promised Messiah, prophesied in the Psalms and Isaiah, Jesus who chose to become one of us, Jesus who chose to live among us without sin, and who chose to become our Saviour and our Lord. Consider God. Yes, as the teacher says, we can factor God into our life and rationalise our way through time, our time under the sun. We can make God an insurance policy God, to be feared because to do otherwise simply doesn't make sense. Or, or we can take on board that we're the ones who've made a mess of things and hear the difference that a true relationship with God can make in our grief and our trouble. And we can hear even in this ancient text the echoes that point us to Jesus who lived a sinless life, wore a crown of thorns and died in our place. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us to Jesus this morning, wants to lead us to consider God. Pray. Pray with me. Father, the challenge is there. We have a choice to make, to live with you just as useful or something to, someone to be feared because it makes sense, or someone who is inviting us into a deep, eternal relationship with yourself because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Help us to value 
that second choice beyond all others. And we pray this in your Son's name. Amen.
Thanks, Nick, for leading us in that song of worship. Thanks, too, for Jenny and others who've taken part in the service online today. As we come to the close of our service, what better place to leave it than focusing afresh on Jesus? Let me close with these words from Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. And so the passage goes on. Let's come to this loving Lord in prayer now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being with us through this service. We thank you for the, all that you have given us. Come by your spirit, we pray, and help us through this next week. Father, we thank you for all that you have given us in Christ Jesus. We pray your blessing on one another now, that we might indeed live to share Jesus with others and those around us. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.